But what I wanted to share about tonight, I didn't feel like I had a specific topic choice, but I just decided to title it Rejoice um, in the Spirit or of the Spirit. And something I kind of wanted to begin with is just don't forget to stand upon a verse. I realized I didn't, I didn't actually stand upon a verse or I didn't think I was standing upon verses in my life when I was just living. But today, as of today, I actually realized that there were a lot of things that I was actually standing on and that I was actually using to help me get not, not be not worry and have strength, not my strength, but God's strength. And I, I guess I'll just dive into these verses and just kind of do my best to share how they've, they've been able to impact me and how I think that they can impact you. One I want to start out with that I just came across today was um, Jude verse 24. Jude verse 24 says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and without great joy. Um, what this is referring to is that God is able to present us before his all-glorious His all glorious presence that's holy and that's completely pure, that has no wrong, no sin in it. And we're able to be in this presence because Jesus came and died for us. And he's able to put us in this presence without having any fault. So to me, that was just, that was just kind of a thought, a thought for the day, a thought for you guys. And he's able to do this with great joy. And that kind of just, that just says a lot about our God, that he's willing to put us shameful, wrong, sinful, fleshly, into this holy presence by purifying us with his, with his holy blood and just allowing us to be present in his glorious presence. That's just, that's just what I wanted to begin with. And then um, now I want to turn to a verse that we all know, Philippines 4.13. Shout amen when you're there, if you're there. For those of you that have Bibles, most of you don't. <laughs> I don't hear any amens. <laughs> okay. Philippines verse, verse uh, 4.13 says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And I actually want to read a little bit before that too, just so we're aware. Never mind, I'm not going to read before. But the point is, we have strength in God. We have strength of Christ. That's not necessarily always us, but it's God. And one thing, I know that a lot of the decisions that we make, personally, myself, sometimes I pray about something and I immediately know what the right decision is. I know what I need to do. But deep inside, I want to go against that decision. I want to go against the clarity that God gives in that answer. Like when we, when we come to God and we come to, into our prayer, uh, prayer closet, like Michael was saying, and we take away everything that everybody's saying, when we take away everything around us and just simply ask God, I feel like every single time, deep down inside, there's such a clear answer inside. There is such a clear answer. He is clear with his answers. The Holy Spirit immediately hits us with that thought whenever we ask him. At least that's the way it's been for me. And sometimes it's, yes, it's different and you have to see over time and everything. But a lot of times the answer can be so simple and so clear. But a lot of times we actually go against that answer and without even realizing we want to, we don't like that answer because we're afraid to trust it. So we want to weave our way around that answer and justify it for our answer and combine God's answer into that one. And at the same time, we don't realize that's not God's answer. That's not God's plan for me. And a lot of times, personally, I've had problems trusting God and just being like, okay, God, this is your plan. I know that this is your answer and I'm just going to follow it. But no, it's not the way it works a lot of times in my life. So what I, something I encourage is I would literally come before God and I'd be like, God, I feel like I am not going to make the right decision, but I just pray that you will strengthen me, that it won't be my strength, but it will be your strength. And as you continue to pray and to persist and try to make a decision that you feel like you can't even make, as you continue to do that and just go after the Lord by reading your word, by praying, by constantly doing this, all of a sudden you feel like you have strength to make this decision, to do, to do something that you couldn't trust before, but to actually trust it right now. And um, now, 
with trusting in the Lord. Romans 8.28, something that always comes up in my head. I feel like this verse is always popping up in my head. Um, let's flip to Romans 8.28. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. As believers, as followers of Christ, we need to not worry and to know that everything is in God's hands if we allow it to be in God's hands. A lot of times we're saying, hey, it's in God's hands. We trust you, God. But we don't allow the spirit, we don't open up to the spirit. We don't allow him to move, we don't allow him to work. And we're just like, I'm going to be closed off, I'm going to be closed off from God. But I'm going to say, hey God, I trust you and I hope you'll do, I hope you give me this house. I'll give you, I hope you'll give me this car. But at the same time, that's not where the rejoice is. And God wants us to understand that the rejoice in the Lord is not in the things, is not in what we see all around this world. It's not what everybody else thinks is true rejoice. It's simply in him alone. I was going to share about this later, but Paul, a man that wrote a large number of the New Testament, a man that was not, by worldly standards, he was not rich. But in God's eyes, he was definitely rich. And one thing you know is, we all know Paul, right, from the Bible. Do any of us know a per some person that was rich in the Bible? Some person that was rich and that remained rich and that provided for his family, and that's all he, that he did in his life. Do any of us know about that man? No. The people that were there like that, they either changed or they walked away from God. That's all we know. We know about the man that uh, didn't give up. The, Jesus told him, give up half or give up your possessions and come follow me. And he turned around and walked away. We know about that man. And we know about, I believe it was Luke that actually, or was it, that actually gave up his money and went to follow Jesus. So my point being is riches in the world are not rejoice. It's something that we always think is. We always think that materialistic things are the rejoice, are the happiness in life, but they're really not. The true riches that Paul had in his spirit, rejoice, that he always had with him, that always made him the happiest person alive, even when he was in jail, locked up, was the riches of God. Was, and how did he get those? He was serving God. That's, when you serve God, you become like him because Jesus, he came and he served us. So when we serve, when, we, when we're able to actually go and serve him, that gives us rejoice. That gives us a new being, a new character. And we're able to, we're able to be renewed and constantly change and form according to God's purpose for us. And I just want to tell you that God will make all things work together for the good of you when you love him and when you are called according to your purpose for him, when you're living out after your purpose, when you're walking after it, and whatever your purpose is, pray out to God. Cry out to him. Find out what your purpose is. Continue to seek it. Wherever you are right now, whatever situation you're in, whatever people are surrounded you, that is your purpose. That is your calling to go after that, to seek that. And I just want to tell you that when you begin to seek those things, when you begin to walk out and just want to be an example, want to just represent Jesus and actually Put an effort to it. No, we can't all do it perfectly. Sometimes I feel like I'm the worst person in the world at it. But it takes an effort. And if you continue to put an effort forth, you will see beauty just start to come all around you. Even in my, in my workplace, um, there was this, just one of my friends. He was very close to me. I, lo I, I love the guy. But I knew that he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily living all for God. And I knew that he was just into some things that he didn't even want to be in, and he realized it. And I just continued to not, to just set my eyes away from that, separate the sin from the person, and just look at the person with just rejoice, constantly just represent God to them. No, don't ever be afraid, not, to not ever be ashamed to just speak out about God, to just constantly give reminders, to just constantly have good conversations about Jesus. And even though we would have conversations and I would know like what's going on behind the scenes where nobody knows. And even though I would know those things, I would just, can, just be myself around him. Just be, be like, I, like I love to be, which is all about God, all about Jesus. And soon enough, all of a sudden, I just began to see transformation in this man. I mean, this man is completely different. And a lot of times, I mean, 
most people around that I like hear about him or whatever, uh, they have a really hard time believing. They're like, him? No way. This man? No way. <laughs> but I'm just like, yes, yes. And they're, they're actually like, I won't believe it until I see it. Um, but it's great. And he's actually now basically just getting into more of his calling, which is worship and just uh, praising God with his voice. He's got a beautiful voice. So I'm really happy for him. But it all starts with just trusting God with the situation, just allowing whatever circumstance you're in to just allow God to use you in that. You don't have to go across the world to preach the gospel. You can preach the gospel every single day. It can be a little phrase. It can be maybe a long lunch with somebody. It doesn't matter. It's perfectly normal, and it's the love of God. And you don't always realize it right away, but over time, or sometimes right away, but over time, sometimes well, with my circumstance, over time, I saw how God completely changed people around. So now moving on to John chapter 14, verse 25 through 27. And before, before I get into John, um, I actually want to talk about how most of, us, most of us probably know that he was Jesus' favorite, but what I thought, what was really interesting to me, just as a thought to give you guys, is that John was actually exiled, I believe it was for preaching the gospel, preaching Jesus. He was exiled onto an island. I think it was called Pam Stick or something. I don't know. It's something along those lines. Huh? Patmos, Patmos, yes. He was exiled to an island called uh, Patmos, and he was by himself on this island. Get this straight. By himself, imagine yourself with nobody around you. There's no one near you. By himself, felt like all alone, and technically most of you or I don't know, I, I probably feel pretty alone. In a way, probably feel pretty depressed. I mean, you're exiled for showing the love of Jesus, and you got nowhere to go but this island where you're stuck by yourself. No, John was not like the world. John was like Jesus. And John just began to pursue the Lord with all of his passion. That's why we are able to see the book of Revelation, exactly what God revealed to him, exactly the image of uh, Jesus coming down in his tongue, being like a sword, and John lying there like a dead man, not knowing what to do because God's glory was so powerful. And, got, and John got to see Jesus in a completely different way, not like anybody else, not with the wounds, not as a holy person standing there, but as an all-glorious Jesus. That's how he saw him, and that's how he described him. And God revealed the entire book to him because he was able to separate himself. He separated himself in such a way that it didn't matter that nobody was around him. He continued to pursue the Lord even though there was nobody there. And sometimes I wonder for myself, if there's nobody around me, if there's nobody else to do anything how would I react? What would be my first instinct? What would be my first reaction? What do we want our first reaction to be? Is that going to be of God? Is it going to be of a rejoice? Or, or is it, is it going to be like John? And something I want to strive for is to, be, is to be really like John. But Jesus, I mean, John was striving to be like Jesus. So in reality, I'm striving to be like Jesus. But John is a great example of what it means to just go after the Lord, not depending on everybody else. Not, not because, you know, you want everybody else to just be like, hey, good job, good this, good that, but simply by yourself. And when I, um, I, took, I took a little break to the beach by myself, I just wanted to go, and I was there at the, and that's how I thought, how I started thinking about John is because I was just like, wow, this man was all by himself, and I felt, I felt kind of by myself. So I was just thinking about that, and I was by myself on the beach, um, Climbed some rock that nobody else was at, and I was, like, reading my Bible and stuff, and it was super windy. I thought I was going to die, but it was cool. <laughs> so, um, and I'm reading John, and I get it, like, I'm reading First John, and I get, no, 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 yeah, I'm reading First John. And I get one chapter into it, and I'm like, what the heck am I doing here sitting, reading John? I was like, I should be living John right now. Because everything, that everything that's proclaimed in the Bible, a lot of times we just keep it there. We don't actually, I don't take it out all the time and just continue to live it. We're like looking for some special revelation to give to everybody for this specialty that we only want to receive and that we think, oh, this is going to be super special, supernatural, but we don't realize that supernatural is just living this. When we live this, it's already the supernatural, and we begin to see that in a different way, and 
I just encourage you to never, and encourage myself to never depend upon people around, but just depend on God and the Spirit alone to guide you. Like John was by himself on an island. He was striving for God with all of his heart. And in fact, that actually helped him and gave him more time to just go after the Lord. And I just want to encourage all of you to not be like uh, Romans, like Michael shared Romans 12, 12 2, do not conform to this world, but I, I believe it's like, but allow it to renew your mind, it's something along those lines. Yes, I didn't hear that clearly, so I'm not going to restate that. But um, just continue to allow God to move you. Simply God alone, not anybody else, not anybody else's opinion, but God's word, God's spirit, because God's spirit speaks clearly. He speaks clearly, and we know what the answer is. We just, we, sh we have to, I have to strive, and we have to strive to just not try to justify it around to make it the answer that we want, but to simply just give up, give into it, because we know that everything that is of God, it should actually, it should actually scare me, it should scare you to not, to not uh, immediately obey the answer or whatever, whatever it is that the Spirit is putting on your heart. It should be kind of fearful to not do that because, just depending on your circumstance, obviously, but in my circumstance, anything that it's, that's not of God, that's not obeying God, it's likely the devil trying to work into your life because with, with Christians, as Christians, when we go further and further and deeper into a relationship with the Lord, the devil can't get to us with a simple, obvious sin. He's going to try to weave his way around and find something to get to you with, whatever it is, whatever it is, your weak spot, whatever it may be. And it always comes across so innocently, so, so as just nothing but then all of a sudden you start to realize it's completely wrong. And I just want to tell you that the answer that God gives is clear. And it's something you always want to obey because God makes all things work together for the good of you. So if he's telling you an answer, it's for your good. It's not for your bad. And I guarantee you when you, when you disobey God, even if it's not like an obvious sin or something, if, when you disobey God, you're basically over time that's going to be, bring distraction because it's not of God. It's going to bring destruction. So instead of bringing destruction into your life, you can bring God, God, which is of beauty, and everything he does is going to be for your good by simply obeying him. That's another encouragement. Then, I never got to John 14. Okay. John 14, verse 25 through 27. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, this is Jesus himself speaking, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I have with you. My peace I give you. I, didn't, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Jesus, as he's leaving... He says, he says to the disciples, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because the Spirit is coming. So Jesus had so much trust in God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that he lived by, that he was like, do not be afraid. Imagine Jesus was with you and he's like, do not be afraid. I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to be here and I'm going to be inside of you actually. I'm actually going to immediately, before going further into depth on this, I want to immediately go into John 14. Verse 15 through 21. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live in you, you also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. A lot of times, this spirit that God sent to us for us to always have, almost as if we're following Jesus right there physically, he's right there. The spirit is, we're following the spirit, but the spirit is not right there, it's right within and we don't have to find physically Jesus because he's within and he left so that we can have him within so that it can actually be easier so that he can be a greater helper in all our circumstances, in all our life situations. And a lot of times 
we ask, Spirit come, Spirit overflow, and the Spirit will overflow, and the Spirit will come, but the Spirit is already inside of us. God's, God doesn't have to come down to have the Spirit in you. The Spirit is already in you. His glory can come down, but the Spirit is already in you. It's inside of you. The only thing that's keeping us from the Spirit a lot of times is ourselves. We limit ourselves from God. Um, consider, think about this. If you get into a routine, like before you eat, you pray. You kind of have generally the same prayer. It's the same thing. It's most likely for the most of us pretty short blessings for the food. Um, you're used to that. And that's, that's exactly where you're going to limit God to. You're going to limit him to that prayer. Or let's say before you're going to bed, um, you, let's say, like to have like a two-minute prayer. And that just gives you comfort, makes you feel like I'm good, I'm right where I need to be. And a lot of times that's all you need. But sometimes God wants to go further and deeper, and he wants to reveal more of himself to us, more of his love, more of his spirit. But we restrict our own selves. And that's just a little situation. I do this all the time. You res I restrict myself from the Spirit everywhere all the time. You just think about it. Whenever the, the Spirit gives you a thought of go and do this, go and do that, go and do that, how many times have you denied it? But think about the greater side of it. When you have accepted it, when you have been like, okay, doesn't feel the best, but I'll just go pray for this person that's limping, and you end up praying for them. And sometimes in my circumstances, there have been times where they're healed, and there have been times where they're not healed. But either way, I remember uh, when David was giving a testimony, either way, you feel rejoice. You feel, you feel a happiness because you obeyed God. And when you don't obey God, you don't necessarily feel that same happiness. So I want to encourage you that the joy is in obeying God. It's in obeying his spirit that is always there to speak to us. And his spirit does not close himself off from us. We close ourselves off from the spirit. And we, we restrict him. We keep him from us by not necessarily always going after him unashamed. And a lot of times fear actually keeps us from going further. And fear is of the devil. Fear is not of God. And if we're just like, okay, you know what? Stop thinking about fear Screw this, I'm just going to go do it. If we just continue to press on, continue to do that, we're going to have rejoice in our life. We're going to be able to rejoice like Paul did, where it's not going to matter how rich we are. It's, things like that won't consume us. They won't hesitate us. Our popularity, our status, this, that, everything that you want, everything that you want in this world, basically, they're not going to hesitate you. They're not going to keep you from being happy just because you couldn't get this car that you wanted or just because you couldn't buy this home or just because you couldn't have that or that. They're not going to hesitate you. The only thing that's going to move you, the only thing that's going to keep dr driving you is God. And as you keep striving for God, he's going to form and throw on everything that you really need. God is going to make all that work together for the good of you. Now, lastly, Philippines... Um, chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. So, um, Paul, in this letter that he wrote to, to the Philippines, which is one of the first towns that he visited uh, when he began his ministry, he wrote this, I'm practically 100% sure. He wrote this while being locked up in a jail cell. And as he's writing this, he says, so we can just see the example that he's not being affected by the fact that he's in jail. Not whatsoever, because he's not of this world. Not of this world because of Jesus. He says, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will stay, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. He encouraged us to constantly rejoice. But how do we rejoice? How do we always remain um, in joy? We we. Walk out the will of the Lord. If we're not walking out the will of the Lord, and I've heard people say, I'm trying to rejoice, but I just can't. Because you're not doing anything to be consumed by God. You want to do everything for yourself, but you want the joy of God in you. And so I just encourage you, whatever you're going through, just go out and just serve God. And he's going to fill you 
with a joy, rejoice. He's going to fill you with the joy that these men had. And these men had that joy because they were living in God. They were living by the Spirit. They were allowing God to work through them. That gave them the biggest rejoice. Not everything else around. The greatest thing that we really need in life is Jesus. The thing that we're all born in need of is Jesus. Everything else is temporary. Everything else is a really temporary joy. It doesn't last very long. And even the richest people in this world have committed suicide because they couldn't find anything else to buy that would give them more rejoice so the point being is those things there's no point of striving for those things and I'm guilty of that too a lot of times there's no point of striving for those things when we can strive for Jesus who's actually going to fill us with a joy who's actually going to fill us with rejoice and that's that's it thank you very much um let's pray let's stand up and pray Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And we just open our hearts to you. We open our hearts to, for you to move in us. And I just pray that we would all be filled with an encouragement to go after your heart, to go after a relationship that would really, that would really help us in every day of our lives, that we could really be an example, not just, to, not just to ourselves, but to everybody around us, that we would be able to show others the love of you, that we would be able to serve you, God. I just pray that you would be the ultimate helper, that we would always look to you for advice, that we would always look to you for answers, that we would never be guided off, that we wouldn't look for our own answer for our own way, but that we would just continue and that I would just continue to go after your heart, to go after you and to accept you, accept all of you and just trust you and know that whatever you have in store is whatever is best. And I just pray that you would rejuvenate this trust in us, that you would rejuvenate a desire, a passion to go after you and to make your name known, that we would know that, that our greatest rejoice lies in that. Our greatest joy lies in just being able to serve you, to be able to serve a king that's above all that we can't even sometimes understand because you are, you are all the time, you are forever you were in the beginning and you were in the end. And I just pray that you would rejuvenate my heart, that you would rejuvenate all of our hearts to continue to go after you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. And I believe Vika has a testimony? Or, yes? Okay, we can all take a seat and welcome Vika with a loud clap. So I just wanted to share... Um, this actually ties in, it's kind of funny, with what Michael was saying and what Joe was saying. You know, it goes with obedience as well as taking yourself and, like, putting yourself apart and seeking God. Um, so about a year ago, I think it was in July of 2014, I had, like, a prophecy spoken that God was really going to use this summer, 2015, to really take me and put me somewhere new and really grow and do something big in my life. So I went throughout the year with that kind of in my mind, but I really had no idea what God was going to do. So um, it was around March. My mind was on conference, on life, school and finals and college and work, and I totally forgot about everything. Like, I was not thinking about God coming and doing something in my life. I was just, you know, going living the day to day. And so I was sitting... I think it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. I was on my iPad. I was messaging a friend on Facebook. And this is totally weird that I was doing this because I was so tired. And it was a couple, I think it was maybe like a week before conference. And um, I had finals. I know that. So I was messaging a friend. And as I was um, waiting for her to reply, I was just scrolling through Facebook. And I saw this ad from God Will Provide Missionary School. And I pressed on it. And... <laughs> Little did I know what God was going to do. I started watching this video. It's like three minutes long of their Youth for Christ program. And literally like one minute into it, I can't explain it. I can't tell you what it was. It wasn't like a voice from heaven. But I just knew that I was going to be there. Like I knew that God was going to send me there. And I'm sitting there in my bed and I'm like, I do not want to be a missionary. It was so real. I'm like, God, I do not want to go to missionary school. I have a ministry here. I have my friends here. I'm growing here. I'm perfectly fine. Do not send me to missionary school. And I just knew that the Holy Spirit was like, Vika, you're going to have to go sign up to this thing. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So, um, yeah, I'm actually ashamed that that happened. But um, I prayed to God, as always, and I was like, okay, God, if this is you, just give me a confirmation. Just let me know that this is you. Literally, the next day was Sunday. 
I remember coming to church, and a friend came up to me, and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm getting ready to go to Mexico, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, is this your first time? No. I was like, when did, like, what, are you going with an organization or something? And she's like, yeah, the first time I went, I went with God Will Provide. What? <laughs> okay, first confirmation. And then after that, just confirmation on confirmation, God was telling me that this is his will for me. So I signed up, and obviously I researched everything, and I'm like, there is no way with my, both of my parents who were like, my dad didn't even have a job, I think, at the time. My mom was like barely making any money, you know, and we were really struggling financially. I'm like, there is no way that I'm going to have the money to go to missionary school. Like, absolutely no way that in two months, even if I saved up everything that I was making, there was, like, it was unreal, you know? So I didn't even ask God to send me money. I was just like, God, you just, if you want this, like, you're going to have to make a way. And so um, before I even got um, a reply from them that I got in, um, a friend of mine took me out for um, lunch, and she, she's talking, blah, 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 and she starts talking about her mom and her business. I'm sitting there, I'm like, that's really cool. Like, this is super random. And she starts saying that, yeah, you know, my mom heard that she wanted to go to God Will Provide, so we just wanted to bless you. And she hands me a check. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, are you serious? I don't even want to go. God, like, what are you doing? And so literally, like, the check paid for, like, a third of my tuition. And obviously, I thought that, you know, the rest of the money was going to come through donations. But God had his own ways. And he just, like, provided opportunities for my parents to go and, like, have extra, like, work and stuff like that. And the money just came rolling in, and it wasn't even a problem. So um, I go to missionary school, and every single day, that I'm there. It was such a struggle. And it was the biggest test of obedience and faith because I woke up each morning and I was like, God, why am I here? I don't want to be a missionary. I will do anything, but I'm I'm not called to be a missionary. That's not where my heart is. And I don't want to be here. And every single morning I would go and we would go to school and on the bus ride um, or in the vans, as we were going back to the Hogan house where um, I lived with the girls, like so many times you guys have no idea I'm sitting in that van and I'm like I'm going home I'm packing my stuff God will provide is like in Portland so my mom can easily come and pick me up I'm like I am packing my stuff I'm calling my mom and I'm going home I do not care I do not want to be here I want to go home with all my heart I don't understand like I get on my knees and I pray to God and I'm like God show me more of yourself Tell me who you are. Show me what, what I'm doing here. Okay, if you don't want me to know why I'm here, just give me more of yourself. Let me feel your presence, and nothing would happen. And every single time, God knew that I was going home, and I was going to, um, or we were driving in the van, and that I was planning to go home. One of the girls, or even one of the leaders, would just turn and be like, Vika, we're so glad that you're here. And my heart ripped to pieces like, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? So we start getting ready for Mexico, you know, and I have my own thoughts, you know, not hearing God speak to me for so long. I just start jumping to conclusions like, okay, I'm going to go to Mexico on the missions trip and my heart's going to change. I'm going to love being a missionary and all this stuff. And I really wanted to be in the skits ministry to be in like plays, you know, and like do this stuff. And I get put on kitchen duty, me and two other guys. Out of the whole entire school, I get put on kitchen duty. I'm like, are you serious? Are you kidding me? So every time that there's practice, uh, you know, a section of the school is learning worship songs. Another section is doing skits. Everyone is doing, like, kids ministry and stuff. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm going to cut tomatoes in Mexico. I'm going to go to Mexico, and I'm going to cut tomatoes for my team and onions. What in the world is happening, you know? So um, it was really funny. A few weeks before we went to Mexico, I thought I was going to go crazy. I was like, God, if you don't speak to me now, like I'm packing my bags. I'm going home. I'm so done. I don't even know if this is your will anymore. So we go to um, a park on the Columbia River. So it was really hot that day. And, you know, we were running around. We went swimming, blah, blah, blah. So as we were going back to the, like, public little restroom thingy, it's like this concrete little block, right? Um... I walk into this bathroom, because I was going to change and, like, get dry and stuff like that. I walk into this bathroom, and I just see, like, toilet paper all over the floor. And it's, like, a humid day, so it's disgusting. Everything's dirty. And I look at everything, and I'm like, oh, that sucks for whoever has to clean that up. And that's when I heard God's voice. 
Vika, clean it up. Out of everything, like, all these two months, God, I've been asking for your voice, and he's telling me, like, humble yourself and clean up this bathroom. And I'm like, are you serious right now? Like, what is going on with my life? Like, what? what? I paid all this money, or more like God provided all this money. I come to missionary school to cut tomatoes in Mexico and clean up public restrooms. Like, I don't understand what's going on right now. I'm so confused. So I, like, clean up this bathroom, and I, like, walked out of there a changed person because I was like, this is crazy. Like, I don't understand. Um, and even till the last day, I graduated last Sunday, actually a week ago. When we were going home, I looked back and I'm like, what was that all about? You know, like, yeah, I might have impacted a few lives here and there. God, you know, showed me a, f- a f- couple of things, you know, but there wasn't any huge thing that happened to me except when I hit home and I realized that I'm so unworthy. Like, I came home and I realized looking back on those two months, I'm like, God, I am the most selfish, unworthy lying, cheating, foolish person on this planet. And I, like, I just remember this quote like, that said that if you were the only person in the world, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ would still go on the cross and die for you. And I just remembered to that quote and I was like, God, I'm so not worthy to die for. I'm the last person who you should suffer for because I've done nothing right ever. I, you, you provided this way. You've opened this, this amazing opportunity. I got to go to Mexico. I didn't have to worry about a single thing. You know, I get to come home to this comfort, to everything, to back to my friends, back to school. God provided me a job miraculously. You know, all these different things, and I'm so unworthy. And through everything, I look back, and I'm like, wow, something changed, but I didn't even notice it. You know, I came back, and I was like, That's so crazy. And as I look back on the night that, you know, I heard the Holy Spirit tell me to go to this missionary school and dedicate two two months of my life, I realized that there was nothing that would have stopped me. Because I've come to a place in my life where, like, if God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. Because I know if I don't, I'm going to regret it so much. And, you know, there's so many times where, yeah, it's hard. And, you know, it was weeks upon weeks that I was like, God, how are we going to get this money? How are we going to get this money? You know, and my parents didn't even believe at first that it was God's will for me to go. And then the check came, and then job opportunities came. And my dad, um, one of the days that I was just a wreck, we got to call back home like once a week. I called my mom, and I was bawling, sobbing on the phone. I'm like, Mom, I want to go home. And she's like, hold on, Vika, I need to tell you something. I'm like, I don't care, just pick me up. And she's like, no, hold on. And she's like, you know, it's crazy. Me and dad didn't believe that this was God's will for you. And right when we paid the last one of your fees to go to Mexico, she's like, all of the opportunities that God had opened, like, started fading away. She's like, me and dad know this is God's will for you. So you're staying. And I was like, God, why? (laughs) Why me? You know, why me? And yet, so many times I came up to the altar and I was like, God, send me whatever you want me to do. I'll do it for you. And then God actually pushed me out into the biggest test of faith in my whole entire life. And I was sitting there and I'm like, what is happening? What in the world is happening? And so to anyone who's sitting out there, you know, there's internship here at church. There's so many opportunities out there. I would suggest that you dedicate something to God. If it's finances, if it's getting up at 5.30 in the morning to pray, if it's going to internship or going to missionary school, if you know that God is calling you out to dedicate one thing, go after it. Because I'm telling you, I don't know what's going on, you know, ahead in the future in my life and what God, why God sent me to missionary school, for what purpose, for what's coming up in my life. But I can tell you that God knows exactly what you, what you need and he will provide the way. And if you're just obedient and you have full faith that this is God, go after it. Like, that's my biggest encouragement. And I hope this blessed someone. And I'm so glad to be home. So praise God. <laughs> And we're glad to have you home, too. Can I have the worship team come up if you guys are still here? I feel like worship was a little short, so we're going to end with worship, too. (laughs) Can I share a story? Actually, first, before, she reminded me of Mexico. Thank you. Was there anybody else who maybe had a testimony from Mexico? Who I know we kind of rushed last Sunday real quick. Um, Maybe we didn't get to hear from you. Wow, Mexico must have been fun. 
Um, I, I wanted to personally say, I, uh, this was the first mission trip that I took as a big group, and such a big group, and I was just blown away about your guys' faith. I mean, to hear some of the people come up and say, you know, we prayed for a lady in a, in a wheelchair, you know, that's something that would have taken a lot of guts for me, and I've been a Christian my whole life, and I've prayed for people, and I've, you know, prophesied over people, things like that, but, but just to see your boldness, and it's easier said than done, but the person that's being obedient and is doing it gets the biggest reward gets that biggest blessing and gets that biggest I, I don't know just that biggest portion from God and I just I truly believe that this trip was not just a trip that Pastor Slavic dreamt of or, or uh, just wanted to do just to change things up a little bit it really did shake up our youth and it really did I believe imparted something small into your hearts into your lives and I promise you when you invest your time into other people you're going to be the one reaping. There's a verse that we often use for, for when we do offering. Cast your bread upon the water. You know, that also means cast your time upon the water. And the Bible says, and it'll come back to you. Whatever you release into God's kingdom, it never just, you know, well, here's the breadcrumbs for you. You did good. Thanks for obeying. No, God pours over and over. God says, test me. That means test me in my obedience. That means test me in my finances. That means test me in my, do you trust me? Test me with faith. Those who went to Mexico for missions, I just, I don't know, it's burning on my heart. I want to encourage you. You didn't just waste your time. You didn't waste a week. And you know, you didn't just spend that bus ride for nothing. I know that was a whole testimony in itself. I came in on Sunday and I'm like, Lord, I thank you that everyone's alive. And I just avoided some parents <laughs> for that Sunday. But I'm telling you, the first time I went to missions, it messed me up. I couldn't, I couldn't live my life the same way anymore. And I couldn't, you know, even just spending time with you guys. Thanks for accepting us here at Youth. I mean, just spending time with you guys. It messes me up when I see transformation in other people. You know, Avil was showing me some videos this before service about the, the wildfires that are, uh, that are going on. And you see this 40-foot wave of, 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 this, of this flame just coming and it just consumes everything inside. It doesn't matter if there's like, I don't know, if, if they see what, willow beasts or some cattle on the way or people's houses, the fire doesn't care. And I just had this like spiritual picture in my mind. God, what would happen if, if we united as a congregation, as our youth, and we just became that one big flame, you know, a spark here, a spark there, a spark there. And just doesn't matter what's in our way. We come and overtake the city of Vancouver. Overtake your school. Overtake, you, you know, the, the churches around us. Just overtake the malls and areas. God, what would happen when that fire blows through? It doesn't leave the, thing, the way things were. Obviously, you see a visual transformation. What you have inside of you, what that mission trip did, what, what services do when we come together, it just, it builds you up little by little. Your job, when you go back to your home, when you go back to your school, is to cultivate that. Pastor's not always going to be there for you. You know, we can't just keep following you around saying, you know, God loves you. You're a good Christian. You're, just, you know, there's a point in time where you say, God, I'm going to take what I'm learning here and I'm going to cultivate that inside of me. What Joe is preaching today. God, I'm going to rejoice in my circumstances. God, you put that joy inside of me. I'm going to go out and practice it regardless of what happens to me tomorrow at work. Amen. Can I read a short story to you? I know I'm taking up a little time here, but it kind of talks about given your entire life, what it means, what it would look like if you gave up your entire life to God. This comes from a Haitian pastor, so Africa's kind of close to me. A certain man wanted to sell his house for $2,000. Another man wanted to buy the house really bad, but he was a poor man and he didn't have the full amount. And after much bargaining, the owner agreed to sell the house to the man for $1,000, but the reduced price came with a stipulation. The owner would sell the house, but he would keep the ownership of one large nail protruding from over the door, the entrance door. Several years later, the original owner decided that he wanted to buy the house back, and understandably, the new owner was unwilling to sell. As a result, the original owner went out, found a carcass of a dead dog in the street, and hung it from the nail that he still owned in the house. 
Soon the house became unlivable from the stench and the family was forced to sell to the owner of the nail. If we leave the devil even one small peg, he will return to hang his garbage on that nail. Being completely sold out for Christ doesn't mean you come to the altar and you say, God, here you could have all of this stuff, but I'm going to keep this thing hidden right behind me. Or here, God, you can know all my secrets in this portion of my life, but I'm just going to keep this one really, really dark so you that never get to it, you know? Being committed to God means you come just as you are, and it means you let him have every single part of you. It means that you hold nothing, nothing from him. And it, if that means him snipping some things away from your life, you better let him do it. Because you know what's gonna happen. The devil knows right where to go and right what to pick at and right what to what to haunt you for and what to, to, to talk about you and what thoughts to attack and what things to attack in your life. He knows it, he's not dumb. But thank God for a smarter God. And thank God for God's spirit and wisdom. Amen. Speaking of this commitment, uh, Vika touched on it a little bit. But internship is coming up. And I was just kind of sitting here and thinking back to all the times that I tried to do, like internship or Bible college or things like that. I just wanted to be sold out for God. You know, just, Lord, take me wherever you want to. And believe it or not, every single opportunity that I ever applied for and tried for was shut before me. I don't know why, I still don't know why, and you know what, I've stopped questioning why. But I did want to say, if you are thinking about internship, and if you are thinking, is it for me or is it not, cast your bread upon the water, and it'll come back to you on every wave. That is what the Bible says, and God never backs out of his word. If you're the person sitting here and you're like, I need to develop my character, and somebody needs to admit that to themselves right now. I just need to develop my character. I have no discipline in my life, can't even get up to work on time. I'm late every single day. You know, from the most practical to the most spiritual thing. If that's you, listen, internship is for you too. Some of you guys honestly just need to separate yourself from your friends. That can solve a lot of things for you in life. Some of you need to separate from those family members that just keep nagging at you and just keep bringing you down. An internship will do that for you. And you can see that change. Somebody needs to just learn how to be under somebody else's vision and authority. When you learn how to do that, God's going to reward you with greater and then you get to follow through your vision and you get to follow through the, the plans and desires that God put into your life. And if somebody thinks that, well, internship, you know, at my church, I'm going to feel a little awkward and, and, you know, it's my leaders, my pastors, they're going to get to know everything about me. Listen, it's going to be good. And you're going to see, I don't think anybody has ever regretted internship here. Or ever, anybody's ever regretted going to college and getting an education? No, you say thank you to your teachers. The process was long. The testing was hard. You never wanted to go to school, never wanted to do any of that stuff. But in the end, you're an educated person. Imagine if all of us were educated for Christ. If we were all edified and, and had the skills and the tools that we all needed, we would conquer this place, I'm telling you. And I've got so much faith in our generation, I'm just excited to be alive in 2015. <laughs> I'm just excited that, that I get to be a part of all of this and I get to be a part of your life and your transformations. So that's my spiel on internship. And if you guys still want to sign up, there is still time. Uh, internship starts in exactly two weeks, and it's going to be an awesome, awesome year. We have about 18 people signed up already. That's a huge crowd. That is one good group. So if you want to be a part of it, you can still do that. Next Sunday, we are having a... Um, no, next, not next Sunday. September 6th is Back to School Bash, right? And then if you do want to be involved in planning or helping... Talk to Joe, and he can totally get you plugged in. That's going to be fun. And uh, Friday nights are our prayer nights. It's a good time for you to develop your prayer life and uh, learn to pray and just, just soak in and worship. So prayer is 10 o'clock. And I think that's all my announcements. So if you guys want to stand up, we're going to end with a song. Holy Spirit. Okay. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. I challenge you to make this particular song, these last three, four, five minutes, however long it takes, just make it different for you. Really press into God. He's not done yet. Just because the service comes to an end, He's not done with you. He's not done with ministering to you. So whatever it takes for you right now, maybe separate yourself to the end of the room or, or to walk away from the friend that you're standing by if you're embarrassed or ashamed. Whatever it's going to take, press into God and just say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. And right now, God, we just thank you for the work that you started in, in the service, God, and just the season.